thank you very much for coming and tuning in. We're here at the Henderson Church of God of Prophecy, and I'm going to be interviewed by a good friend of mine, Eric Father. God bless you, Eric. I appreciate you having me. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you is what inspired you to start the book Soup in the Workshop? That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, when I first moved to North Carolina, I was looking for a job. I, you know, um, the economy was bad, nobody was hiring, and um, so I went to work for the prison. I went there just for a paycheck, so I thought. And I started working at the prison for about two weeks. And then the Spirit of the Lord began to deal with me. And the Holy Spirit said, you cannot keep ignoring what you see. Because that's exactly what I did. I come out of work, I look around, and I really didn't want to see. But I had to stop ignoring. And that was that and at that moment I was inspired to do something about what I was looking at. Okay. Now before we get the first story in the book, the guy BH um showed me and a lot of other people wanted to know how did you come up with that name particularly? BH is something because these are actual people. Um, the story has two different people's perspective. BH is just to remind me. When I was making my notes, I put it there and I just kind of left it there. Oh. Uh, but there were no actual uh, people, and those stories actually really happened. All right. Now, the thing about this book, it ain't too thick. A lot of people don't want to read something too long, so it's short, sweet, got a lot into it. But uh, I want to know how long did it take you to write the book? It took uh, approximately two years to write this book. It's funny because um, I would write a sentence, and then I'd ask my family to come and read it to me and ask, well, did it make sense to you? So it took me about two years actually to put this book together. Um, I wanted to make sure, um, that's why the, the lettering, if you look at it, there's large print, because it needs to be appealing to everybody. Um, the younger and the older. Now, the second story, which is another favorite of mine, prevention. What does that mean to you? And can you give me an example? Well, we are people of prevention. We have preventive medicine. We put locks on our doors to prevent somebody from coming in. Um, we're living in a society of prevention. And it's true. Uh, ounce of prevention is worth a ton of regret. And believe me, you will regret it if you go to prison. And it's easier to prevent something than it is to fix it once someone has gone into the system. I mean, the, the system is, is, is uh, designed to keep you there once you go in. They call it the revolving door, going in and out. So we want to get the young kids. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine. And I said, Pastor, we got these young boys in Sunday school class and stuff like that. Let's get it into, into their hearts not to go to prison at a young age. So we want to prevent it. So, uh, by reading this, giving this information in the young minds and hearts, I honestly believe it will prevent this massive incarceration. Okay. And for all the people that's trying not to go to prison, what would you say the first step to prevention is for them? The first step of prevention is knowledge. Because when you know better, you do better. The information in here First of all, it talks about, you know, uh, prison, prison life. Really, this is the truth, not a myth, not something somebody made up, not somebody getting out and saying, I'm a man now because I did prison time. No, this information, you take it to heart, that's the beginning steps. And because when you know better, you do better. Yeah, I can understand that. Now, when you work in prison, you hear a lot of different testimonies in the prison and stories about people being separated from their family, removed from society. So can you tell me what does that mean to you? Oh man, it's a, it's a shock. You are removed from society. You got birthdays, holidays, graduations, um, funerals, all different things. Life keeps on moving without you. You're removed from society. You can't vote. Um, anything that's going on outside, they call it the real world. And here in the prison, say, you know, I've been in the real world. Because that's the truth. 
the world keeps on moving, and you have been, because a person has been a menace to society, they've been removed from society. It's, and another point about that is, a lot of people don't understand how strong the law is. The law appears not to exist until you break the law. You can commit the same crime, maybe a thousand times, and you begin to feel like, ah, it's nothing to it. But once you get arrested, you'll see the strength of the law. The first thing that you lose is your freedom in your own hands. You can't go to the bathroom unless you have permission. You can't eat without permission. Instantly, the strength of the law will remove you from society. Another thing, too, I wanted to ask you, I know you work in the prison, so you see and hear things like this firsthand, but does it affect you? How does it affect you seeing these things and just being so hands-on with these type of things every single day? Once I had to face the facts and stop ignoring it, I was mad. I was furious to see uncles, to see brothers, to see fathers, cousins in prison. I was furious. The talent. Yeah. I, it affected me. It, it was, um, and people say, well, you know, um, I'm angry, I'm meek, but I'm angry. I can control my anger. But the passion went into this book. Angry because of the intelligence. Preachers are in there. Preachers can quote scripture. You know, I, I do pastor this church, and a lot of times when I'm looking for a scripture, I can ask one of the uh, pastors in there, they'll find it for me. I mean, my, my, my reaction, um, anger, sometimes saddened, because it's, it's a very serious thing. Yeah, it is. It really is. You being a pastor and an author of this book, who would you recommend it to the most? It's amazing, because um, if you look on the back, I say this book is for you. Mm -hmm. And you know, I say this because it's such a broad audience. The vision I have is that every classroom and every school in America should have a copy of this book. Because that's the age group. A young man, if a young man never makes it to the ninth grade, he'll drop out of school. And statistics say when a person drops out of school, most of the time, they'll get a young girl pregnant on the way out, and they can't find a job, especially in this economy, and then they'll wind up uh, in prison. So who would I mainly recommend? Of course, it's for everybody, but schools. All right. On part two, I really wanted to touch on the three R's respect, responsibility, and recreational. I want to touch on them individually. So let's we'll start off with respect. Respect, what does that mean to you? Respect is everything. As I was talking to different inmates about respect, there was one particular inmate, and he's in the book too, where he talks about he was raised uh, in a good family, and slowly he began to lose his self-respect. He went from um, not using profanity at all to cussing out in the streets. He got to the place where he wouldn't dress himself properly. And he talked about going days without taking a bath, going days without shaving and different things like that. You know, uh, the more he lost his self-respect, the more trouble he got into. And he, in one particular event where he was holding a sign, he said he got down to the point where he was holding a sign, begging for money. Now anybody knows you're pretty low. You've gone way, you know, pretty low, and you can hold a sign on the corner and ask for money. But he went to a particular area where there's a lot of traffic and um, different hotels and things like that. He saw this limousine pull up. He thought, oh, what a big payday. And as the limousine pulled up and the window, went, window came down, he saw his classmates. It was his classroom, his class reunion. <laughs> and the people were getting to laugh at him and tease. And he said at that moment, the, he could feel the last bit of self-respect die in him. And within a matter of hours, he found himself in prison. Respect is so important. Respect for the law. Respect for your community. 
I found out that the people who are more disrespectful insist on more respect. Those who don't respect others, but they want respect. Everybody wants respect. Everybody, you yeah. know. And 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 um, you find people who are very disrespectful. When you disrespect them, man, don't diss me, you know. But what about you blasting your music so loud, can't nobody else hear? What about um, robbing other people? What about um, you know? No matter what, I mention this. No matter what country you're in, it's wrong to take another man's life. It's wrong to take another man's property or damage somebody else's property. It's wrong to rape. So of course, you know, not respecting others and doing these things will definitely get you in prison. Okay, responsibility. Wow, that's a good one. Responsibility. You, there is no freedom without responsibility. Freedom and responsibility run congruent. You take a child who's very responsible, the parent gives them freedom. Um, you take another child who's not responsible and um, he wants to borrow the car keys. So, no, you ain't taking my car because I don't believe you're going to come back. Freedom, the, the freedom and responsibility goes hand in hand. Yeah. And um, you take a, you, you, when, when a person is irresponsible, automatically you lose your freedom. It's true in a home setting and it's true in society. An irresponsible person gets thrown into prison, being removed from society because they're irresponsible. They fight, they, they throw tantrums like a child, they take anything not belonging to them, but they have, they have a sense of, of that they can just take anything whether they pay for it or not. And society can't handle irresponsible people. You'd be removed. Okay. And the last one, which is my personal favorite, and it's something that we all need, recreation. Recreation. Outstanding. You know, um, one of the questions uh, that I asked the inmates, why did you get arrested? Their response is, I was just having fun. Just having fun. And yet, their fun um, has got them into prison. Recreation. I challenge the, the type of songs because we're living in the day where songs are singing about murder as recreation. Murder is recreation, you know. Um, and we need to understand that that's just a song. And you start living out that, you out there, you're calling yourself having fun and you're doing a drive by shooting. Remember, it will always be the same thou shall not kill. We need to begin to uh, let our young people know that's not recreation. L recreation should have what I call the LFF. Your recreation should be legal. Your recreation should be fair. Because if, it's, if I'm having fun at your expense, that's not recreation. If, and, and, and rape, rape, if you're gonna, if you're gonna have sexual recreation, you need to make sure it's legal and fair. Is it fair to pass a woman around like a pizza box after you've uh, given them some type of drink or date, rape, drug. That's not fair. And so we got to lay, what do we call fun? You know, is your recreation fair? And how will you feel when your family and friends find out what you have done? When your family and friends find out um, the level of crime you committed? I see inmates who can't look their own families in the eye. Or um, they get no phone calls and, and have been written off because of the type of crimes they've done to a close family member or a friend. And so, yes, the LFF is really important. You can find all of those in here. All right, another story in your book that I wanted you to touch on ghetto myths. Yeah, the ghetto <laughs> myths is good. I was talking to a, a inmate, and see now you gotta understand. A lot of the people in prison are very intelligent, and this particular inmate, he um, was a gang lord, and he told me he convinced the young men that that block was their block. He convinced them so much so that they were able to they they would die for that block. They'd sell drugs on them. If somebody else came in their territory, they would kill and die for it. And the, the funny thing is, no real estate papers. They don't own that block. And that's in one of the ghetto missions. You know, 
You don't own that block, but you're willing to die for it. And you feel like, that's my street. It's not your street. Until you went out and you worked and got a job and you paid for that, that's not your block. And those are the type of things that we discuss in ghetto groups. Because people really believe, this is my hood. This is my corner. It ain't your corner. <laughs> you can buy that corner. All right. Now, on page 148, I just wanted to read a small portion of it. It says, I believe in people. I believe that with the right message, people will and are changing. This book is designed to prevent the senseless killings, drug dealings, poverty, and massive imprisonment of our youth. My workshop will include singers, dancers, quality speakers, radio and TV time, as well as travel expenses. I ask everyone who can purchase this book as an investment for safe streets for our children and youth. Now, a question that I had about that is, where can I purchase the book and what is the cost of it? This book only costs $15. Now, if someone who smokes cigarettes, that's only three packs of cigarettes. And, and when someone purchases this book, it allows me to give one away. Please, if you could actually, if, if you would invest in buying this book, I'm going to do my best to get this message out. Um, TV time costs, uh, hiring good actors and different things to act on different things, traveling expenses, hotel. I have a big vision and I need you to support what we're doing. You can go to lindenstanbergministries.com. Again, you can purchase this book. Um, and I can personally thank you. I can personally thank you for buying this book. If you go to my website. You can also go to Amazon.com and they'll ship it out to you. You can also get it there. Um, if you purchase the book on lindenstanbergministries.com, you enter into a raffle and you can see the link on there and it goes straight to there. And for every 100 books I sell, we're going to raffle off $100 just to show appreciation, just to give back. You know, and, and uh, but yes, I need you to support what we're doing here. This is a movement. Join our movement. Going to prison is to be removed from society. Going to prison is to be removed from society. Going to prison is to be removed from society.